So now we'll continue one equation models. And just to give you an overview of what we're going to do with one equation models is we're going to look at um, at least three. Uh, maybe in the future we'll look at more. But the first equation model, the first one that was really ever created and proposed without solution, of course, was of the lack of computers, was by Ludwig Prannell. So here's my history slide I usually use for him in my compressible flow class. Um, this is him obviously a little bit later in life, and this is him by an early um, water channel. And uh, I know you've heard his name a lot in the class. He's a German fellow, 1875 to 1953. And um, this is one of the papers we talked about in the class that he might be most famous for as, um, as a um, researcher and professor. And that was the one where he proposed boundary layer theory. And I would argue that's a Nobel Prize winning idea because of the impact it had on our world. But the paper we're, we're going to look at today um, is published, I think, in about 1945, which was in Germany at the end of World War II. So it's kind of interesting to think about how his university and everything he built um, kind of fell apart in that point of life. Uh, so a few interesting things. He had a number of doctoral students, and we've talked about some of these in this class too, like Blasius, Right, so technically the solver you're developing right now for laminar flow, the profiles that are fully developed should look like Blasius solutions, right, for laminar boundary layers. Uh, von Karman started JPL, um, and there's other names you'll recognize in here. So anyway, let's uh, go and look at the one equation models now. And I mentioned Prantl's paper, and I actually got a copy uh, it is in German, of course, so for those of you who speak some German or want to use Google Translate, you can probably go to the class website, download it, and uh, you can flip through this paper. Um, but the nice thing is the notation that we use today is consistent with the notation of Ludwig Prannell and his students. So you can see there are certain terms like, hey, here's U prime goes as a length scale times your shear, partial U partial Y. And it's a short paper, but it does lay out what people consider to be the first one equation uh, model of turbulence. So that's what we're going to look at first today. Uh, then in this same class, we're going to look at the Baldwin-Barth um, turbulence model, which was one that uh, took the K-epsilon model and reduced it to one equation. And it was considered to be the first closed form uh, turbulence model because you didn't have to specify anything else about the solution, like say distance to the wall or something. Uh, after that, on Thursday, we'll look at probably the most used um, one equation model, which is in almost every CFD code in existence, which is of course the Spallart Almaris turbulence model. And we'll spend more time on that model than probably any of the other one equation models. And then we'll move to two equations. So that's the big picture. So there's the cover page. And um, now we'll just kind of look at some of the major parts of this model. And I should mention here also that uh, it's not really a good idea to just take this model and put it in a code and run it because it's not very predictive compared to experiments. So it's kind of written down based on theory and ideas developed by Prandtl's group over 20 years. But it did take people with digital computers to take it and modify it. And uh, I, I saw some papers which are go up all the way to the 90s, which tried to take Prandtl's model and modify it with different terms to make it predictive and useful. But it's definitely not the workhorse model. But all the one equation models today probably have some connection to this model. So it has a lot of historical significance. So uh, what did it start with? It really started with the turbulent kinetic energy equation. It was the basis. And as you know, that's an equation for K. Like a transport equation. And in 1945, as you can see in this paper, Prannell postulated that the dissipation forms or is in a form of equation which we already developed, 5.10. And if you look in your notes, that goes as the dissipation is k to the 3 halves over L which is the turbulent kinetic energy divided by a length scale. So that's a simple dimensional argument. And then he introduced a single closure coefficient, which uh, is written as C sub D. So there's a closure coefficient for dissipation. 
and now it's a three halves over L. And uh, just by doing this one little simple uh, relation between chi and epsilon, um, you can see that there's some unspecified C sub D, which we would need to calibrate or choose later, and but there's an unknown length scale, right? So this is the same like turbulent length scale and it's totally unknown. So length scale might be approximated as something uh, like in the previous algebraic models, um, you know, like say distance to the wall or use some Van Dries modification. And uh, it um, is a reason why the model is seen as incomplete because we need to specify something about the solution before we solve the equations. So it is the only real unspecified part of the model. And uh, basically, like I mentioned, there's about 20 years of research experience plus measurements by a huge group of students, about 70 to 80 doctoral students, not all of them made it through the program, under his guidance that kind of gave him the insight to try and write down and close the model. And a few things that he, he kind of saw in his viewpoint was he's saying that the length scale goes as something as a mixing length scale. And, uh, and that the ratio of production to dissipation of turbulent kinetic energy is constant. And so this means the uh, model's probably an, an equilibrium model, like most models are. Uh, he also made a thin layer approximation. And uh, that's shown in equation 4.18 of our notes. And it goes as say partial u partial y, um, goes as negative u prime v prime bar uh, to the 1 half all over some mixing length. So there's a little differential equation. And now since he's saying production and dissipation are balanced, this would mean that say negative u prime v prime bar of partial u partial y goes as negative u prime v prime bar and the three halves over L mix goes as CD of k to the 3 halves over L, which is this term here. And uh, so what does that mean? We can write L goes as L mix, as I mentioned already, if negative u prime v prime bar over k is a constant in uh, terms of the modeling. And uh, that's actually turns out to be a really good approximation uh, for uh, shear layers and boundary layers that are kind of uh, moderate speeds and subsonic for mild compressibility. And it turns out measurements uh, show that this ratio or constant is about 0 0.30 or about a third. And that's true for Thin shear layers and uh, boundary layers. So, based on these uh, little assumptions and arguments that Prandtl made, Prandtl proposed this model, which is basically shown in the development of the paper. So, equation 5.13 is the uh, K equation model of Prandtl. And you can see in your code it'd be hard you know, hard to program because um, it's a whole nother differential equation and pretty complicated. It's not in boundary layer coordinates really either. So uh, the unknown is K, turbulent kinetic energy, and uh, there's that CD constant factor, and here's an eddy viscosity, and uh, what else did I want? Oh yeah, here's L. So you see L is also an unknown. Now uh, this uh, shear stress which is in 5.8. We'll go and show it. Oh, it's another page, sorry. Um, okay, so that should be a uh, negative two new T 
uh, Sij, right? Yep, minus two thirds k of Kronecker delta function. So here's the Eddy viscosity definition. Um, we've already we're just going to say this Eddy viscosity goes turbulent kinetic energy to the half times L. So that's dimensionally correct. And then here's the model. And uh, so this way, now we can relate L to K and epsilon. So that means, uh, or it should mean that something like uh, nu is equal to K half L times a constant. And there's that CD. Okay, so, uh, you know, this is a big assumption that CD is actually a constant in uh, this equation. And uh, Pranel, without much insight, he said uh, CD is going to be about 1.0. And I think it turns out that if you evaluate this model, um, that's not a great assumption. And if you make models like this and your constants aren't constant, then you need to build in additional empirical functions for this. And so that's one particular reason I view this as maybe not a great model. Um, here, uh, mu t is ratio of maybe u prime v prime bar, for example, to mean partial u partial y plus partial v partial x. And it turns out that this quantity mu t uh, will not follow um, mean flow scales like the edge boundary layer or boundary layer thickness and k or l, turbulent kinetic energy or length scale. So these are assumptions that are we're seeing uh, being violated uh, today by this model and maybe they're not the best ones. Uh, other tidbits is, um, you know, this model is an equilibrium model, so I should absolutely write that the model must have a flow in equilibrium, which isn't a big deal because a lot of these models you say are equilibrium models where production, dissipation are balanced. Okay. Um, with all this, this model, you can see we still need to kind of uh, find and estimate link scales and also specify the closure coefficients, um, which are here and here. So a number of people tried to do that. So this is what Prantl laid out, and he gave estimates, these closure coefficients. So other people came along and said, well, if I took his Prantl model from 1943 and applied it today in a code, because they already had Rand's, one equation Rand's codes, it's easy to program another single differential equation and explore what he did historically. So there's a few efforts, and uh, Emmons, and Glush, 1965. They applied this model to a few flows um, with little success, and they said sigma k equals 1 and uh, cd. They tried ranges between 0 0.07 and 0 0.09, which are much smaller than what Pranel um, used. So what they did is they had a number of experiments. They just basically ran their solver of Pranel's model over a small range and uh, didn't find good results. Which is too bad. Um, probably uh, other ones, um, another one worth mentioning, which I saw in the literature was by Wolf Stein, 1967. And my note was that uh, he introduced a damping functions and a model of Van Driest and found 
satisfactory results. I wouldn't say they were great or excellent. And so just solving this K equation with this really simple closure scheme here, even with modifications and calibration using modern, more modern methods, all the way through 1993. I saw the last paper published in 1993. Nobody could get this to be like as predictive in accuracy as more modern models. And it's mostly because of these types of assumptions. Um, in this paper, uh, you can try and improve these models um, using a few different little tricks. And uh, in boundary layers, wakes, mixing layers, and different flows, it turns out that Prandtl was onto something. And it, it's shown through these measurements that the shear stress term, tall xy, which is off diagonal, goes as beta r times k, where that's tke. So remember, tke goes as the trace of the Reynolds stress. And that means the off diagonal term, tall xy, divided by the trace of tau is about one third. And uh, that's confirmed by a wide number of measurements. So this might mean that the uh, stress for energy ratio is constant. And a lot of people call this little constant beta um, as either Bradshaw or Townsend's sorry about that Townsend constant and uh, so that could be a clue to a closure coefficient for the model so um, another number of people tried to take Prandtl's one equation model for K and uh, formulate um, using this relation to close the equations and uh, found some good results. So using equation 5.15 with Prandtl's model, found um, better results. And uh, it's interesting, there's actually a paper by Bradshaw which is part of the reason its coefficient might be named after him, uh, a formed hyperbolic form of Prandtl's model. And uh, what that allowed him to do is construct a marching code for a one equation model with K, just like we have a marching code in our class for a one or zero equation model. Anyway, um, this particular model was featured in the Stanford Air Force Turbulence Modeling Workshop, and that's what's shown in this particular figure. Um, these are the measurements of Bradshaw along with a similar modeling effort. This is distance along the plate. And then CF is skin friction. So this was considered a pretty good prediction. And as you go further downstream, then your predictions are more aligned with um, measurement. And, you know, the, up there, they basically have, you know, a wind tunnel and with a flat plate mounted in it. So in this area here, up where X is zero, you don't always expect your models to be well aligned because uh, this is not exactly a top hit profile hitting the bleeding edge. It's especially an elliptical flow. Okay. So let's just make a few notes about Prandtl's model here. Um, well, in practice, I guess this, I guess the last thing I want to say about Prandtl's model, since I guess the last paper really publishing and using his approach in 1993, is that uh, it, it takes a lot of work to get to work. So first, uh, we need a lot of additional assumptions. 
to make the model work. And uh, in the turbulence workshops, which still go on today in different forms, um, uh, Prandtl's work is important historically but the researchers trying to create better RANs or LES approaches aren't using typically one equation K models. And it's partly because of you have to find some additional closure. You, and they're not really uh, models that contain, uh, you know, they're not closed models because still you have to specify something about the solution. So based on this Stanford workshop, there was some people there and their name were mainly at NASA Ames. They were uh, Lomax, uh, which we've already talked about their model, but there was someone named Tim Barth. And um, Tim Barth and his collaborators took these approaches and uh, went on to create a model which is closed, and they found a way to estimate dissipation based on local flow properties. And that's what we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, um, maybe after a short break.